I want to begin by st- speaking about the sureness of the foundation of God's so great salvation. The Apostle Peter very accurately and concisely revealed this to the people of God, even about the salvation of their souls. This is the salvation we're talking about, the salvation of men's souls. He described it as the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow. Both of these accomplishments and workings are absolutely essential into the salvation that God has purposed. Without the sufferings of Christ, there would be no glories that followed. And without the glories that follow, this would not be the salvation that God has purposed. Now this this working and accomplishments, the main ones, are done between the Father and His Son. This is, this is the, the, the basis of the, of, the, of the surety of salvation. That which God had purposed and that which Jesus has accomplished. Now the scripture tells us that these things were kept secret from since the world began. But now, but now, see, there's been a, there's been a change. There's been a, a, a the, the, the purpose of, of, of God has been accomplished in the sufferings of Christ. And now they are being declared through the, the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ and by the scriptures of the prophets. These things, this, this word of God is opened up through the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit would reveal these things to the people of God. And as I speak about the people of God, I want this just to be known that the ones they are talking about that the scripture talks about are those who are crucified with Christ. These are the ones that are joined to the death of Christ, but nevertheless they live. But they live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved him and gave, and gave himself for them. This is who, I, who I'm speaking about, that who, who the Spirit is revealing these secret things of God to. He are revealing things that no man had seen. No man had heard these things. No man had even known about them. But men must see and must hear and must know and must partake of them to partake of the salvation of their souls. Now this working of the exalted Christ, after he had received the promise of the Father, he would send forth the Holy Spirit into his people. And precisely as Jesus himself did reveal of the Spirit's working among God's people, the Holy Spirit did not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, those are the things that the Holy Spirit would speak about. And the things that the Holy Spirit heard were not things pertaining to the earth. They were not pertaining to temporal things. These were things pertaining to God and of His Son, Jesus Christ. These things that transpired in the heavenly places. This is what the Holy Spirit heard. This is what the Holy Spirit would speak unto the people of God because it ministers to faith. Now, this Holy Spirit heard those things that were spoken from another realm, the heavenly realm, by inhabitants of that realm that were far beyond the sight and the hearing of mortal men. The things spoken of there were of great glory, manifestation of divine power, and an exaltation of of a man, Christ Jesus. And for that reason, the Father sent, gave the, the Spirit to the Son, to send them into the people of God to minister to faith. These were things that were concerning the man, Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, and of His entrance into heaven, and of His acceptance by the God of heaven, of Jesus Himself being set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, from the earthly perspective, from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven to when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, those ten days, 
There's not recorded much in the scripture about those ten days that occurred in the earth. And there, and that, I say, is rightfully so. Because all the focus of the Holy Spirit there was on the things that were occurring in the heavenly places. This is recorded for us. The heavenly places, these events that were going on in the heavenly places, that's what the Holy Spirit wanted the people of God to, to hear about. Amen. These events that were going on there about the man Christ Jesus who had passed into the heavens and was approaching the dwelling place of the holy, holy, holy God. All of heaven, all of heaven was focused upon the man, Christ Jesus, coming into heaven. And how would God react to this? At first glance, they noticed Jesus approaching in bright red garments. He did appear glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength as the one who is mighty to save. And he is. But see, as he approached the gates... He did not approach in the pomp and the ceremony as an earthly king would approach, with victorious and mighty to save. Make no mistake about it, he is mighty to save, and he is approaching as a victorious king. But he is approaching with the power of an accomplished death. He approached with blood-stained garments as he got closer. They saw his garments would stain with blood as a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. And God saw him. And when God saw him, he was satisfied. He was satisfied with his sacrifice and with his offering. And a decree sounded from the throne of God to the benefit of all mankind. He said, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. But the Scripture through the Holy Spirit also tells us of these benefits were not all under the the Son. The Son that accomplished death, those benefits would flow on to, to believing men. He was our forerunner. And He entered in for us. Hebrews 6.20 So the decree from the exalted Christ went forth. Don't close those gates. Don't close them. Because there's a righteous nation that keepeth the truth that they may enter in. And now Jesus is appearing in the presence of God for us. See, when Jesus entered in with his own blood, God received him. He was satisfied with Jesus' sacrifice and offering. And he said, put a crown of pure gold upon his head and crown Jesus with glory and honor and clothe him in the garments, the holy garments of the high priest and put the vesture of the King of kings and the Lord of lords upon him and give him the scepter, the scepter of the rule and the reign of the kingdom. And with this decree the Father gave to the Son, to the exalted Son, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And rule he is, and rule he shall forevermore. And that rule now that he is exerting is unto the accomplishing of God's eternal purpose. There's a purposefulness in what God is doing, and he he exalted Jesus into this position Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet. This is, this is, there's a purposefulness in this. God does nothing without cause. And this cause that is the exaltation of Jesus is unto the fulfilling of that purpose that God has purposed in him. So God would exalt Jesus. He would give him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in both submission and in adoration. There are some who willingly submit and bow to Jesus because they've been given to see, they've been given to see something about him. But there are those who will be forced to submit before him. Be they things in heaven? For the command of God and the Lord of hosts has sounded, 
Let all the angels of God worship Him. Or if there be things in the earth, even if the most mighty kings of the earth, one word, by one word, the exalted king, these so-called mighty kingdoms of the earth are torn down and another one lifted up. History records some of the deaths of these mighty kings as something that just happened. He died unexpectedly. That's how history records the death of some of these mighty kings. But the scripture reveals it's by decree of the exalted Christ, who says, Thou fool, this this day thy soul is required of you. And he takes away the kingdom and he gives it to another. Or if they be things under the earth, like him that had the power of death, and had is that key announcement of accomplishment. He had it, but not anymore. See? That's the announcement that what Jesus has accomplished. For in his death, Jesus has entered into the house of the strong man. He bound him and spoiled his goods. And he brought out the prisoners from the prison. And them that sat in darkness, he brought them out of the prison. The announcement of the scripture and all that we've heard even this day is that Jesus is not just another prince in a long line of succession of princes. Because no other prince was able to accomplish what Jesus has accomplished. No other prince would be able to accomplish what is still testified of him till yet accomplish. Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the chief of the kings of the earth. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is the exalted one that God has exalted. Now because of Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of the majesty on high, that which God has purposed shall come to pass precisely as he had purposed it. In Isaiah 43, 19, the God of heaven says, Behold, I will do a new thing. And it shall spring forth. Now this, the springing forth of these, this new thing would begin in the heavenly places. As the heavenly hosts beheld the man, Christ Jesus, exalted to the right hand of God. In his exaltation, there began a new and a fuller understanding by the heavenly host of God's manifold wisdom and of his ways. See, in that exaltation, they saw things about God that they hadn't seen before. This new thing was already beginning to spring up, but it was occurring first in the heavenly places. They were given to see what the sufferings of Christ accomplished before God. And they were beginning to see about the glories that would follow And just as Moses and the children of Israel had done when they were redeemed out of Egypt, when God had done a mighty work with them, they were given to know more about the truth of God. And their response would be they would be singing new songs. New songs broke out in the camp of Israel. You look in in Exodus 15, there's a record of the song. And I won't read the whole thing, but but I'll just read enough to show you that These were things that God had revealed to them in his working, in his redemption. But I also want to point out that these are also testifying of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. When they were redeemed out of out of Egypt, Moses and the children of Israel sang unto the Lord. He said, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. See, these are things that they were given to see about God through that redemption. And they were singing that the the right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed the the enemies into pieces. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that have rose up against thee. And he set forth his wrath which consumed them as stubble. And there, was, there came to some conclusions in their song. Things like, 
Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? See, this is our, this is our God. And in that redemption, see, as, as God brought them out of the iron furnace of, of, of Egypt, they, they were given to see something about God, and new songs broke out in the camp. But likewise, in the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the heavenly places, these heavenly hosts saw this exaltation. And they, be, they got this greater understanding about God. And they began to sing songs, new songs, by the four and twenty elders. These were insightful songs. Songs of praise unto our God for the great and mighty things He has done to His beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by His blood, who has made, us our, who has made unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. See, these are the insightful songs they were given to, to sing about. They were singing something here about God's working, about exalting His Son to be a priest, to be a prince and a, and a, <clears throat> and a savior. And this, this, this insightfulness about the, the person of God and His workings was, was spread out to the 10,000 times, 10,000s and thousands and thousands of angels who saw the faithfulness and truth of God. These all joined in with saying with a loud voice about what they were given to see about the exaltation of Christ. Worthy is the Lamb that it was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And the Scripture tells us they all fell down and worshipped Him that liveth forever. Amen. See, this, this was a new thing that God had purposed and it was coming to pass just as He had purposed it. Amen. Amen. Now the Holy Spirit, His testimony of Jesus began in the days of His flesh. He began to, as, as God moved holy men to speak about Him, about testify of Jesus, there's a record. He had a record written for us. One of the things that He, he reveals about Jesus is that having finished the work which God gave His Son to do on the earth, He had finished the work. There was a work that, that Jesus was given to finish on the earth, and in His death, He accomplished it. That was He was speaking about the decease He would accomplish in Jerusalem. And so, after Jesus did put away sins by the sacrifice of Himself, after through His death Jesus destroyed Him that had power of death, that is the devil, after Jesus plundered principalities and powers, making a triumphant display of them in His cross, after Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, that great body of records of our iniquities and transgressions of the law that condemned us, He took them away, nailing them to this cross. After Jesus accomplished all that the Father had sent Him to do through His death, God raised Him up from the dead. God raised Him up from the dead, showing forth... His acceptance of that sacrifice and offering as only God could do. He raised them from the dead. And, speaking of Jesus, He exalted Him with His right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. See, Jesus' exaltation is a divine accomplishment. God did this. And it is sure and steadfast. And through his prophets, he would begin to talk about this, about this surety of, of, of what God is doing in Christ. He says things like this from Isaiah 22, 23. God fastened him as a nail in a sure place. And through Isaiah 28, 16, God laid in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. God set this foundation, sure and steadfast, and He wanted the people of God to know about it. This was a work that God did. He exalted Him with His right hand, but He also placed Him or set Him or set Him firmly in his, at His right hand. 
So God did it with his right hand, and he set him at his right hand. Now, this matter of setting him at his right hand was because there is saving strength with God's right hand. Psalm 20, verse 6. Deliverance and being saved is with God's right hand. Psalm 60, verse 5. And the announcement of what God has accomplished in the earth by his beloved son has been sounded for all to hear, even his victory. So sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Amen. This is These are things that God wants his people to know about. These are the things that minister to faith. And there's reason for all this because there's, there's this purposefulness in God's working that will be revealed as well. See, this, this exaltation of the man Christ Jesus was not only to show forth the excellency of God's power, but also to show forth the wonderfulness of his counsel and the excellence of his working unto the fulfilling of that eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, are we, as we are given to see more of Jesus high and lifted up and set down at the right hand of the throne of God, exalted. See, we do also confess with the prophet, he is wonderful in counsel and he is excellent in working. Amen. His exaltation, the exaltation of Christ is under the full accomplishing of God's eternal purpose unto effecting in his people all the things that pertain to life and godliness. See, Jesus is going to accomplish that for all his people. In order that not only that all the sons are brought to glory, but they must be kept from falling. See, along the way they must be kept from falling. And they also must be kept spotless and faultless because they're going to be presented to him who art of pure eyes than behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. Amen. Therefore, let the good news be heard that Jesus himself declared, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Because that, there's that purpose that God has purposed for his people will occur in a world that lieth in wickedness. With the people of God having to war against the mighty adversary who maketh war with them that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, if you have that testimony and you keep the commandments of God, you have an adversary. See, that's one of the new things that God did in the earth too. Prior to having this testimony and keeping the commandments, you didn't have an adversary. But you do now when you're in Christ. And what about the adversary that we have within? Our old man, who lusteth against our new spirit, being contrary to him so that you cannot do the things that you would. See, these are, these, this is the, the, the environment by which all the, the people of God are having to deal with now. See, but again, there's purposefulness in this. See, we're journeying, we're journeying in a terrible and a wearing and a hostile, wi- in a wilderness. God's showing something about himself in this. And yet, with all this being against us, as we journey through this earthly wilderness, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, as strangers and pilgrims in the land, we have a most wonderful treasure that God has given us. And that ministers to faith. Jesus, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Seeing this and knowing this and partaking of the truth of Christ, see, is that which ministers strength to endure the the world in in the wilderness and the afflictions and the distresses. Because his Jesus' exaltation is not merely ceremonial or honorary. There is still much more to be accomplished under the sons hearing the father declare in fulfillment. It is done. See, that's what this, that's the work that Jesus is is working to fulfill. To hear the father say in truth, 
It is done. Well done, son. It's done. And so Jesus himself would say this of himself. He says, my meat or my delight or my very sustenance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. This is the one that God has exalted to be a prince and a savior. And to his God and to his father, Jesus is ever faithful and true. Jesus' current ministry as the prince and and the savior is absolutely essential in fulfilling all that God has purposed. And that the scripture declares that his is an effectual work. He works effectually. And the apostles announced this, that he had, who had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's, 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 he's been exalted in this position to perform that work. And we are confident. See, in, in knowing these things, we're confident in this, in this very thing because Jesus, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Now, some of the things that the direction of this of this working. Beginning in the days of his flesh, Jesus would begin to declare, what is it? What is that direction? What, what is that that he is going to fulfill? These things that are concerning his people. And it isn't earthbound. And it isn't temporary. All the power and authority that was given to him by the Father would be working under the fulfillment of this. In John 5.24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. See, there's the direction of the accomplishing work that Jesus is doing. It's unto everlasting life. And, there's more, you shall not come into condemnation. And you are passed from death unto life. See, this is Jesus again beginning to announce the direction in which that accomplishing work is going. Now many who heard Jesus speak, even those who were against them, even those who recognized this was no ordinary man speaking. Those who were familiar even with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, knew that none of these holy men of God ever spake like this. He was one who spake who had authority. And authority Jesus has. He's been given all authority. Not by men, but by God. No man has given him this, but God has. So upon hearing Jesus speak, they would comment correctly. And in fear and in awe of him saying, Never man spake like this man. For Jesus is the prince of the kings of the earth. And when he speaks, he speaks in power, in authority of the almighty God. And he is able to bring forth, bring these things to pass, all that he has spoken, even eternal life. Jesus said again in John 6.51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. That's what somebody with authority that's saying this. You eat of this bread, you're going to live forever. Because he's able. See, God enabled him to do this. He's been exalted to perform this. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now some upon hearing these things would say, Lo, he speaketh boldly. But none did say anything to him. Because all power is given unto Jesus in heaven and earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? He has, the, he has is doing the will of God, the purpose, fulfilling the purpose of God, and none are going to be able to stay his hand. And so for the for the people of God, those who are seeking for glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. This is good news. See? We have an exalted prince, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been given a commandment by his Father, whereby the exceeding greatness of his power 
will be demonstrated to us who believe. Jesus said in John 12, 49 and 50, The Father which sent me, He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that His commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father has sent unto me, so I speak. This is, this is that direction by which the exalted Prince and Savior is bringing all the sons of God. John would affirm it, this in 1 John 2.25. He said, this is the promise that he promised us, even eternal life. And Jesus always does the things that please the Father. So after Jesus put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, after God raised him from the dead, after he was received up into glory, God exalted Jesus to finish his work in bringing the many sons to glory. But first, but now, in order for all the sons to make it to glory, they would have to be strengthened. They would have to be built up. They would have to be upheld. And Jesus would do this by the word of his power. By the word of his authority and power given to him by his Father. And his word does come with the power to accomplish all that God has purposed and desired. After he was exalted, his work would be about ministering to the churches. And he would, be, he would be directing that power and authority unto the fulfilling of that purpose of God. He would be ministering to faith. As he was in the midst of the churches, he would speak a word. See, that would minister strength to the people who are believing him. See? For the exalted prince, he does declare with power and authority to accomplish these things. These are said to the church. In Revelation 2.7, the exalted one speaks. The exalted prince declares, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus said, I will do this. I've been given all power and authority by God, and I will give those who overcome to eat of the tree of life. I will do this, is the announcement of the exalted Prince and Savior. So those who are engaged in the good fight of faith, see, these are, these are the things that they need to hear. This is what strengthens faith. This is what builds it up. This is what upholds us. The Gospel also announces, as these things are declared, that God is able to do this. God is able. You look at Jesus, exalted at the right hand of God, you see that God is able. See? He exalted him to be a prince with its many implications that are revealed in the scriptures concerning Jesus and his essentiality and the fulfillment. The scripture puts it this way, Hebrews 12:2. He's been exalted to be the author and finisher of our faith. Isaiah 55, 4 says he's been exalted to be the leader and the commander of the people. 2 Samuel 7, 8 says he's been exalted to be the ruler of his people. The chief ruler. 1 Chronicles 5, 2. See, all these are describing the manifold greatness of the exalted prince. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Him God exalted to with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. And so the exalted one will continue to minister to the faith of his people, to exhort them, to edify them by the word of his power. Again, in Revelation 3, 5, he says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. See, I have been given the authority. I've been given the authority of the books of who is blotted out and who remains. But see, he doesn't leave us unknowing about who those are. He talks about those who are living by faith. 
Those who have been joined to the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism and have been raised to walk in the newness of life. These are the ones that overcome because we do overcome by faith. That's the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So that those who are living by faith and are overcoming by faith, the same will be clothed in white raiment. I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. See, this confession comes with power before God. And, and with that, know this about Jesus. He says, the Father always hears me. So when he, when he was going to confess your name before the Father, know that the Father always hears him. And now this, this power that will be exerted even into the ages to come and the world to come. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. See, so that the exalted one is going to lift us up as well. See, that's the, that's the, we're talking about the glories that should follow now. Because of the sufferings of the Christ, these things are occurring. And it's for this cause, Jesus, Him, hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior. Now being saved to the uttermost, is much more difficult than some men will lead you on to believe. Among many other essential things, saving them to the uttermost requires an exalted prince and savior. Being saved at its foundation reveals the need for one to save you from that which you could not do yourself. And being saved from sin is the foundation of salvation for all men. Isaiah 59.2 says, For your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, and He will not hear. Now this separation that is caused by our sins and iniquities from God is that which no man is able to overcome in his own strength. No man by his own works No man by his offerings to God, no matter how often they are done, or no matter the multitude of the sacrifices or quantity they have presented to God, none of these would cause God to look favorably towards them or to hear them. For 1,500 years of time, the law of Moses proved this to be the case. Each and every time, It condemned and kept those that sinned under its condemnation without any provision of life after the separation from God. The soul that sinneth, it did die. It died before God in the day they sinned each and every time. And the law with all its commandments, all its ordinances, all its procedures gave no command for repentance or for the forgiveness of sins. And the reason for that is there was no just basis for God to grant repentance or to grant forgiveness of sins. But God, and but now, see, He would do a work. And it would be in the provision of Jesus Christ. Romans 3 speaks about this. In verse 23 it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the announcement. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But being justified now through this work that he was going to do through Christ, freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth. See, he set him forth to be this. This propitiation through faith in his blood. See, God, God determined this to be according to his counsel and foreknowledge of a need of a covering for sin. And God set Jesus in this position. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth on Jesus. See, so now that Jesus has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and God has raised him from the dead and exalted him to his right hand, he has the just means now to forgive men. 
He can, get, he can grant repentance unto them for the forgiveness of sins. See, salvation is all about God drawing near to His people and dwelling with them. Of God looking with favor upon them. For God to hear them when they cry. Therefore, the Father sent the Son into the world. And God directed His heavenly messengers direct Joseph and Mary to name their son Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sins. And this is what Jesus accomplished in His decease at Jerusalem. See, the Savior was able to do that which no man was able to do. To bring a blessing from God that He purposed to do in the first place. And so the Scripture announces, having raised up, or having exalted Jesus, He sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from His iniquities. See, that's the chief blessing. Being turned away from your iniquities. That turning is giving you a new heart and a new spirit. See, that thing, you, you don't want to sin no more. So you, 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 you hate iniquity, but you love righteousness. Amen. See, these are the things that God is, is accomplishing in each of His people through His exalted Savior. Through His exaltation, Jesus would do this effectual work in His people. He would turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that you might receive the forgiveness of sins. See, this is a work of an exalted Savior. A necessary and needful work unto salvation. And the saving of His people from their sin, which again I say is not simplistic in any of its glorious accomplishments. These are things that are worthy to be considered all our lives about the things that the Lamb of God has accomplished. But in closing, I want to just bring to your remembrance these two points concerning the Savior. One is of the necessity and of the requirement of God for a sacrifice and offering for sin. See, that's what Moses and the prophets brought forth. That in order for God to be satisfied, there was a, by necessity a sacrifice and offering that would have to be made unto him. But it wouldn't be just any sacrifice or any offering. It would be an offering that would be acceptable to him. One that was without spot or blemish. Which Jesus did in the giving of himself. And by the sacrifice of Himself, Jesus did put away the sin. Amen. Jesus was sent to taste death for every man. For in Him being made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In His death, Jesus did put away sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. This announcement is at the core of the good news that the prophet spoke of, of which was to come. And that which the gospel announces has in truth now come to pass. For when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Through his death, Jesus did accomplish not only the putting away of sin, but also all the other glorious accomplishments that the gospel declares that did come to pass. And this is the purpose for the exalted Christ, the exalted Savior, to make these things known unto the people of God. For to give repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Man, all those that receive and continue to abide in the Savior do receive repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Because Jesus has put it away. In its entirety, He took it away. Now that the handwriting of ordinances that were against us are blotted out. Now that Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. Now that Jesus is received of God, exalted. God now has those solid grounds to be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. To grant repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Amen. It is for this reason... In this cause, God exalted Jesus with His right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance and the forgiveness of sins.
Brethren, this not only declares with great glory and power what Jesus has accomplished, but it also reveals the current ministry that Jesus is now engaged in. A ministry that ministers to the hearts and minds and the consciences of God's people that your sins have been forgiven. God did this. See, your sins have been forgiven. You're now accepted in the Beloved. This is His ministry to bring this truth into our hearts and minds. And He's doing it through the Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ and by the Scriptures of the Prophets. Jesus accomplished this for us. And He's doing it in us. And in seeing Jesus, Him that God exalted with His right hand to be a Prince and a Savior, we do confess with the heavenly hosts the truth of God being wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Amen.